Father, thank you that you are the God of our salvation, that you are the one who sent your best to come and usher in the kingdom of God here in humanity and make it available for sinners like me. God, I pray if there's anything we do today, would it be to worship you in response to you having first come for us. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, we're super glad you're here on this Palm Sunday, and um, we are uh, indeed continuing our series in hospitality, and we're looking at the one who would come with such great hospitality, and we're saying, hey, what does that mean for me? How does, how does that shape my hospitality? And, and maybe Jesus is inviting us to himself in new ways even today so that we might go out and be able uh, to do that for others. We're uh, doing this under the banner, if you will, of Vision 2020. It's a two-year vision to see um, really uh, our sort of our, our piece of the pie here in South Florida uh, to see the number of Christ followers double. So for us, what that looks like is moving to 200 baptisms. We, we have a, a desire to join in what God is doing, uh, and, and we feel that he's doing this in, in a church-united movement. And, and, and like I said, for us, our vision 2020 is to see the amount of our baptisms double. We've never seen that kind of evangelical fruit, but we're trusting God for it, and we're believing that Jesus actually promised that we would be doing these greater things. Uh, this, this whole uh, year and two, and as we move forward, is all based on, on what Jesus tells us in John 14, that, that, he, that we're going to do these, these great things that he did and that we're going to do even greater things than he did. And, and for that to happen, man, for that to happen, we would need a, a shift in culture. And so uh, we talked about a shift in culture from just simply attending things to expecting God to show up and do awesome stuff. That was our study on the Holy Spirit. And now we're, we're, we're taking a look at a, a study on hospitality where we're seeing a shift from being hospitable um, in, in our normal ways and just kind of like what we think about hospitality, and we're saying, man, it looks like Jesus has a whole different way of hospitality. It's, it's a hospitality to our enemies. It, it's a hospitality to the unknown. It's a hospitality to the stranger. And, and so we're, we're trusting as we follow Jesus and we look to him that, that he will help us to understand just exactly what his radical hospitality is is and, and what that means for us as we pursue um, the lost. And, and so we've been defining uh, hospitality as, as a, an idea of, of preparation, right? This greater hospitality means that there's going to be uh, some preparation. And, you know, you can look at hospitality from a couple of different ways, but, but one of the ways that we're looking at hospitality is that means that we need to, we need to, to, to prepare for the other. We need to prepare for the other. Our first series was all about we need another person, this series is all about us needing to prepare for the other. You know that you've been in a hospitable moment when you feel like somebody has prepared for you. I can remember I would go um, uh, oftentimes over to the Sweeten's house from our church, and, and when I would go to the Sweeten's house, it seemed as though they prepared for me because Rob Sweeten, and I don't know about Susie, but Rob Sweeten doesn't like chocolate. He's not a chocolate guy, but when I, whenever we were there, there was chocolate available. There were things available that catered actually to us. And what that said was, like, we thought about you and we prepared for you. We have a heart that's for you. And so as we think about hospitality, we think about this idea of preparing uh, for the other. And, and a greater hospitality would mean greater preparation uh, and we kind of bump, bump our thoughts from preparation to, well, what is, a, what is kind of like a worldly organization that has great preparation? Where would we see this? And, and we would probably see this where most of you spent the weekend at the Ritz. Okay, I think we have a picture of where most of you hang out on the weekend uh, when, when you get a little break from, from the kids or whatever. Now, this is the Ritz in Montreal, and it, it came um, voted as the number one place like amongst the, the Marriott hotels or amongst the, amongst the Ritz um, hotels is like uh, this this place was uh, it crushed it in hospitality so if you're ever in Montreal you know just 
just hang out here and, and, and you'll, the messages that we've been preaching will, will maybe come to life more. Because one of the things that they do is we talk about they use your name. Uh, there's, a, there's a warm greeting and there's a fond farewell. It's very personal. They anticipate uh, needs. But what I wanted to do is I want to look up at their, at their credo. And number three on their credo is this. The Ritz-Carlton experience enlivens the senses, instills well-being, and fulfills even the unexpressed wishes and needs of our guests. Even the unexpressed wishes and needs of our guests. So there's a sense that they've like prepared for you. That they, it's not just that, that, that they knew you were coming, they actually prepared for you. And that message said that, hey, you are welcome no matter who you are or where you are or what you're bringing in. Like we want you here. The way of hospitality does the same thing. The way of hospitality, man, it, it does the same thing. Jesus invites us to this same type of lifestyle as it pertains to the other. The gospel message is very much about the other, that Jesus would come for the other, that he would set us free from ourselves so that we could actually then go out to the other. Now, there's a, there's a kingdom pattern here to hospitality. There's sort of um, a way that God's people should engage in hospitality, and it takes us far beyond just events. Uh, sometimes we think about hospitality as events, events driven. Like, I'm going to have you over to my house, which makes me hospitable. Now, events are probably part of our hospitality movement. Like, we had the crawfish boil. That was amazing, right? Anybody check out the crawfish boil? Any of you guys were able to attend to that? Yeah. Hey, a big thanks to all who made that possible and created a really cool atmosphere for our hospitality. That was awesome. It was like the family of God got to just hang out and be the family. That was a really special time. And so hospitality, man, it does include um, events. It's just more than that. It's like a way of life if you look at it according to the scriptures. And there's kind of like four aspects that help to define this way of life. And we, we, around here we call it love, no, speak, do. It's, it's kind of how we do our counseling community. It's how we do our redemption groups. It's a big part of our, of our culture is love, no, speak to. We think this is um, the kingdom pattern. We believe that this is how God has loved us, so now we go and love other people in the same way. And, and so we believe that God loved us, which means that he moved from where he was to enter our world. And then he knew us. We see that when God breaks in the kingdom of God, which is the reign and rule of God, and specifically in the person of Jesus when he comes, we see that he not only leaves heaven to be with us, but then he actually, he actually knows us. He dwells among us. He spends 30 years just being one of us before he then begins a public ministry of three years. And one of the greatest ways that he knows us is he asks questions. He enters our story. John did a fantastic job last week talking about what it means to ask questions and enter people's world so that God can join them where they are. Well, then he speaks. There's an actual way that, that the kingdom speaks to us. There's a way that hospitality speaks. And we're going to look at that one uh, specifically today. And then the final one is do. Uh, when, when we're really being hospitable, what that means is we not only have people over and we not only enter their story, but then we commit to, to do life with them in both the high points and the low points. And so we've been examining hospitality from this pattern, and, and we find ourselves now in, in the sort of the third theme of it. What does it mean to speak hospitably? Is it, is there's probably a different language to that. My son, who's 13, um, uh, for the last couple of years, ever since we fostered and then adopted uh, two little babies, uh, he has been growing in what we call his BQ. Does anybody know what BQ is? So you might know what IQ is. That has to do with like your intelligence. You might know what EQ is. That has to do with your emotional quotient, being able to like read situations. BQ is sort of a combination of those two where you understand that you're with younger people and there's certain things you can't say around them. For instance, my son, my 13-year-old, he's 13 now, when he was, his BQ has really risen, okay? But when he was uh, like 11 and our kids would be sitting and everyone was happy because they were watching Shrek 2, we were getting a, a moment of adulthood and there was nobody, there was, nobody was dying or getting hurt or crying, profusely anyways, and so we had this moment, sometimes my son, because he had low BQ, 
would come in after having hung out with his friends and say, man, we had an amazing time at the pool. We'd be like, oh my goodness. Because we understood the triggers would go off and our younger kids would then be triggered to be like, pool, pool, did somebody say pool? Let's go to the pool. What do you mean we can't go to the pool? I want to go to the pool. I don't want to watch Fiona. I don't care about donkey. I want the pool. And we would, we would lose this beautiful moment of serenity because of my son's low BQ. Now, he, he has increased his BQ, and he's understood to come in now, and he can tell us the same thing. He just has to say it like this. Oh, my goodness, I had the best times with my friends at the P-O-O-L. And we'll be like, oh, that's so A-W-E-S-O-I-M. That's not how you spell awesome. I know that. I just got on a roll. And so you, if you come to our house, you, you, you might think we're speaking in tongues or something. You might not. What is happening here? We're just spelling out words. Because all of our BQ has risen, and we don't, we're not trying to trigger those three-year-olds. I mean, they're already on point. It's like we have a new way of speaking in our home. We're going to look at today. Jesus has a new way of speaking. He, he, he knows Scripture, and he, and he uses Scripture, and he references Scripture, because the, the, the Scripture brings life. The Scripture never goes out void. But, but Jesus has a different way of engaging in talk that I think many of us might have grown up with or be, be accustomed to even, even now. And so we're going to be um, in, in Luke 7, if you have your Bibles. If you don't have your Bible, um, we have Bibles in, in the lobby, and you have a Bible on your phone, okay? <laughs> Pretty sure as long as you've got a smartphone. So you're going to need it because we're going to be going over quite a few scriptures today, and we're going to be camping out on a couple here at the end, but in order to follow the narrative of where we're going to be, you're going to need a Bible. So, um, and you know, you're going to need a Bible to follow Jesus. You, the, the, the two can't, like, happen. So uh, make sure if you don't have a Bible, grab one on your phone, grab one in the lobby, or look um, with somebody who maybe is next to you and brought one. So we're going we're gonna to be in Luke chapter 7, and just to kind of set up our, our time together, you've got an outline here that'll hopefully help you follow if I kind of lose track. It helps me in that way, and my wife tells me it helps me to like kind of stay with you, you know, and so Hopefully the outlines are helpful for you as well. But um, in Luke 7, uh, we see that Jesus is coming. Luke is written by the physician Luke, so we know that it's very detail-oriented. And man, he's, he's, he knows, he cares about the details. So this is from a, a physician's perspective. And um, he's actually uh, friends with one of the disciples. And so it's, it's through the eyes of, of one of the disciples that Luke is, is hearing these detailed stories and then, and then writing them down and and we see here that, that there's, there's a lot of, in Luke, you may have picked up on it, this whole series comes from Luke. Every, every message is, is from the, the Gospel of Luke. And the Gospel of Luke is like high-end hospitality. Jesus oftentimes um, is either like um, going to a meal, eating a meal, or leaving a meal in Luke. Tim Chester in his book, A Meal with Jesus, breaks that open in a really cool way. Uh, great, great read on the hospitality of Jesus. But, but what we see here is there's a, there's a pretty significant emphasis on hospitality and what happens around the table um, uh, as it pertains to hospitality and the kingdom of God. And so we see that Jesus is oftentimes eating and he's drinking and he's, he's, he's doing the normal things of life radically abnormal. He's doing the normal things of life radically abnormal because what he's doing is he's engaging with, with where we are, but he's, he's bringing an eternal significance to it. And, and here's the problem. Jesus has been eating and he's been drinking with the wrong people, well, according to the religious rulers. He, he never seems to choose the right crowd. I mean, look at his twelve. Look at Peter, who bounces on him in his moment of need. Look at Judas. Look at Thomas, who's with him three years. And then it's like, yo, i got to stick my hand in the holes. Probably not a great pick, Jesus. I mean, those are, his, those are his boys. Much less the crowds that he decides to dine with. It never seems like he picks the right people to break bread with, and breaking bread in this culture was a, a big, big deal, because what it meant was, I'm with you, I'm for you, we go together. If I broke bread with you, it meant like, like we, we, we accept one another. 
And there were certain social faux pas that Jesus continued to trip over because the, the religious high-end elite was like, no, 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 we don't go and eat there. We're too holy. We're too pure. We can't get ourselves stained in those environments. And Jesus is like, that's what the kingdom of God came for. I didn't come to clean them up. I came to give those dead environments life. So I have to be there. So after a few years of Jesus kind of on tour with the wrong people, not exactly sure where Luke 7 falls in the, in the years of Jesus' timing, but he had done enough eating and drinking with the wrong people that he gets called a friend of sinners. He gets, he gets called like a, a glutton and a drunkard. As a matter of fact, go to that next slide, please, Allie. I, I love, keep going. Yeah, this one right here. Yep, right there, perfect. Whoop, look at him. Awesome. This is what they say. This is what they say right before Luke 7 starts, right at the end of Luke 6. You can find it in your Bibles. They're like, look at him. Like, would you just look at him? It wasn't as though what we're trying to do today where it's like, look at Jesus. It was like, look at him. Who does he think he is? Man, he is such a hypocrite. That's what his kingdom pattern got him. And then we, then we get to Luke 7. And we see uh, this idea of, of hospitality gone bad sort of to the nth degree. Well, let's pick it up with, with me, if you would, please. I'm in verse um, 36 of Luke 7. He says this, One of the Pharisees, the Pharisees uh, was a, like a high-end religious official, asked him to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house. Stop, I love that. I love that Jesus is not a reverse snob. He's not a reverse snob. You know how sometimes we can be like so into serving the poor and the marginalized and the broken that we then begin to build bias toward the wealthy and those who have? I don't know, maybe, that, maybe that's just me or something, but like sometimes we can have like reverse snobbery. It can be like, well, man, if, if they have, you know, or if they've, if they've walked with Christ for a while and they've got strong convictions that aren't mine, Sometimes I can have like this reverse because I, I want to be so merciful over here, but, but my heart's prone to wander. It, it creates a reverse snobbery to where I won't, I won't hang out with this crew over here. You know, our biases run deep and they're deceitful, so we have to be careful of bias on both sides. Jesus didn't have them, though. He goes to the Pharisee's house. He goes to the people's homes who, who like, he battled with the most. And, and so he went into the Pharisee's house and he reclined at table. Um, now, what that means is uh, they didn't eat like you and I, kind of um, in, in this setting right here where we're eating. And you know how, you know how we eat, and there's like a table. And I mean, if, if, if you have a normal setting, you eat at the table, and people have good conversation there. If you have kids under five, you know how that's a different setting, and you're like just surviving and throwing food and cleaning up. And it's, it's a different setting. If you, if you like come to my house, the last... Well, the second to last time we tried to be hospitable, we had this couple over to our house, and it was just chaos. It was like, um, speaking of hospitality gone bad, it was Ke Kevin and Lynn. I don't know if they're here right now or not. Okay, yeah, maybe they left the church after this. I don't know, but, but we had them over, and we, were gonna, we ordered barbecue from our favorite place, but they entered our chaos, and so we had Cora in the, in the chair, and she wasn't loving what she was doing, and I don't know what happened, and, and we did Uber Eats, you know, because that's what it comes to when you're on survival mode, and we, so we did Uber Eats, and we didn't like answer the call when they were trying to confirm where they were or something we had never done uber eats so they canceled the order and we didn't realize that we're all like starving and so they were in our circus in the midst of our mess and there was no awesome barbecue there was just like gummies and whatever's in our pantry breakfast bars a couple of different flavors but you know so like it our hospitality and then it got even worse to where kath my wife she, it, she, it, how should i say this it was a little bit of a tense moment. Let's just put it that way, okay? And, and so, um, and I'm trying, and I, I, for some reason, I think I had kid duty and was, was doing, and so Kevin, who's our guest, actually has to get on the phone with the barbecue place, and we like reorder this whole thing, and so it finally comes, but it was, a, it was like a mess. It was, it was hospitality, like, gone bad. And, and it, in our case, it's a messy situation. And we don't always get to be quite as intimate as we might like, with our company because, you know, you're trying to manage a couple of different things. And, and I'm sure that you have your own kind of situation like that. And in this particular context, 
um, th there would be messiness and things like that, but they wouldn't do it at a table like we would do it. It said that they reclined at table, and so literally what would happen is they would go on their left arm usually, just like this, and the table would be over in this area, and everyone would be reclined in this like relaxed, super chill position uh, with their feet facing away from the table, but, but what, what was happening here is they were inviting relationship. Like in, in this situation, you know, I, I'm, I can do my food and I can eat and the food and the drinks is important, but what's really important in this posture is, is our relationship, is the fact that everything else in the world has stopped. Man, and we're just together. Like, what's up? How you doing? Like, we're just, we're, we're in a moment of relationship, breaking bread, which is breaking down walls between us. So this is what, Je this is his posture. It's going to be important in just a second. This is, this is how Jesus is hanging out in these moments. And so, He's willing to do relationship with both sides of the coin here. And behold, verse 37, a woman of the city, it's not what you want attached to your name. We talked about Zacchaeus a few weeks ago, and he got like he was of short stature. This is worse, because this is like of short stature when it comes to her character. What it was saying is like there was some, there was, there was some like serious um, moral failures going on with this woman probably a prostitute, probably somebody who was willing to sell her body um, in the streets to make a living. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. So this flask of ointment, uh, it would have no handles. It would have a long neck, and it would, be ex it would be probably pretty expensive itself, and then the perfume within it would be expensive. And, and so uh, what, what, what you would do in order to use the alabaster flask is you would break the neck of it. And so you wouldn't just like use a little, you know how like we use our perfume right now? It's like, ch -ch -ch -ch, and then we come back and, ch -ch -ch, and you know, like, and we get a lot of, ch -ch -ch. that wasn't the case with the alabaster flask. When you had an alabaster flask, you broke it and you used it, and it was gone, all of it, like the expensive stuff. It was poured out in whatever occasion you were using it for. It would be saved oftentimes for like a special occasion. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering him said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, Say it, teacher. All right, so our first scene here is um, hospitality gone bad. This is hospitality gone bad, right? Jesus is in this setting. He's breaking bread. Some of his disciples may have even thought, maybe Jesus has made it. Like, now we're getting invited by the Pharisees. This is a good thing. And then all of a sudden, this woman from the city, this woman from the streets comes in, undoes her hair, which is a cultural absolutely not, begins weeping over him, breaks this perfume, anoints his feet with the perfume and with the oil, and then begins to touch him. She's touching him. She's touching him with her hands, as she worships him in gratitude because she believes that even she belongs at Jesus' table. It's this beautiful scene of worship where this woman fully understands who she is and has begun more than anyone at the table to fully understand who Jesus is. And she cannot help herself. She can't help herself. She doesn't belong there. This is hospitality gone bad because this has created a radically awkward moment. In the passage, there's like silence while this is happening. Remember Jesus' posture. Remember, he's laying down. His feet are on the outside. And here comes this woman. And she like throws herself at his feet. And, and she's, she's overcome, man. 
She's just overcome. She can't believe that it's getting to happen, that she's actually getting to touch the one who would know her and receive her and accept her. And so she's weeping and her hair is undone. And, and the thing that she saved is being poured out on him. And the set is filling the room. And, and she's touching him. She's actually touching the Messiah. And there's silence amongst the others. Because nobody knows what to make of this. What will Jesus do? How will he correct this hospitality gone bad? I'm going to go ahead and give it away because I'm not sure how I'm doing on time, so I'll give away the what I want, what I think God wants you to hear. That's us. That's his heart for you this morning, right there. So Jesus corrects the situation. And we see that, really, it's hospitality gone really bad. It's hospitality gone really bad. He, he corrects the situation. He doesn't let it lie. He says in verse 41... Uh, a certain money lender, now he's speaking to Simon, the one who had invited him over. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now, which one of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? So she's still there. Some of the commentators think that this woman and Jesus may have had an interaction prior to this where, where she, was, um, she encountered Jesus and, and she uh, understood his graciousness and was invited in to uh, believe in him as, as Lord and Savior and treasure of her life where, where he had um, cleansed her shame, if you will, in a, in a prior moment. It doesn't say that in the passage. Just some commentators believe that they, they had already had this exchange. In, in the passage, it could be happening right then and there where this woman had heard about Jesus. She had heard his teaching. She, she knew about the things of Jesus and she was just being overcome with being able to touch the man who would invite someone like her someone like me, someone like you, into his presence as a daughter or as a son. And so we don't know if this is a prior to or happening in the moment, but what we do know is she's overcome with, with the thought that someone as holy and righteous as Jesus, who rightly should separate himself from pure impurity, actually embraces her as she is before she gets cleaned up, before she makes changes. The only change that she's made thus far is she's come in off the street. She's still got the street on her. She's still a woman of the street to everyone around her. And the only difference is that now she's touching Jesus. Now she's put herself in close proximity to Jesus. And everything has changed. Pray the Holy Spirit invites you to do the same. Jesus has got to correct the situation. And basically he's saying, this is hospitality gone really bad. Watch this. He continues here and, and he says, well, which one would, which, which one would have the, the bigger debt and, and would love more? And Simon answered, the one I suppose who owed him more, Simon answered, uh, um, the one I suppose for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with oil. So Jesus corrects the situation, but he corrects Simon, not the woman. He's like, no, she stays. She's with me. You, you got work to do, bro. You're not with me. How do I know? How do you know that this woman is with Jesus and, and, and Simon is not? It's, it's by her worship. It's by how she responds when she gets in proximity with Jesus. The religious elite is trying to justify himself. The religious elite 
is well put together and he's reasoning with Jesus. The woman from the street is not reasoning with Jesus. The woman from the street is undone. She has been made a fool in this situation, but she doesn't care because she understands the grace that's been poured out to her. Worship will help you to DTR your relationship with God. You know what DTR means, right? Define the relationship. It's always good to DTR your relationship with God. One of the key metrics is your appetite for worship. Do you find yourself worshiping Jesus more like Simon? Pretty put together. Thinking that he and Jesus are kind of probably on the same level. Maybe Jesus a little bit better because he's a pretty sweet teacher and he, he's, got, he's got that whole bread thing happening where he feeds. So maybe Jesus gets the bump, but we're kind of sitting at the same table or... Is it, is it like the woman who like, man, you have moments where you just come undone in worship because you realize who you are and who Jesus is. I mean, when's the last time you wept in worship? When's the last time you just lost yourself in worship and you forgot about the people around you, you forgot about how it sounded or what it was like or your experience of it? You just threw yourself at the feet of Jesus and you're like, Jesus, I get to touch you. I get to touch you. What? I mean, it's a DTR moment, right? Jesus is helpful because he invites both. He invites both. He doesn't, he doesn't condemn Simon to keep him over there. He says, Simon, you're not right with me, but you can come too. You see, Jesus is going to end this passage by making it about Jesus. It's our final scene. It's hospitality gone Jesus. Well, what does hospitality look like when it goes Jesus? Verse 47, I tell you, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. So, when, when hospitality goes Jesus, when, when hospitality goes the way of the kingdom, people end up asking this question. Who is this Jesus? Like they want to know. You see, Jesus was actually the host of the party. Don't miss that. Simon might think he's the host. Jesus is always the host of the party. He's always the one who's doing the hosting and the inviting. And when Jesus is at the center of the party, when Jesus is the host, he always makes it about himself. Not because he's egotistical or because he's on some pride trip, because he knows he has what you need. Your longings are not bad. They're just not strong enough. You long for wealth or for security or for acceptance. That's not a bad thing. You're just, you're just looking for it in the wrong place. And when Jesus makes the situation about himself, what he does is he invites you to fulfill your longing in him because you'll never find it anywhere else. And so who, who is this? Who, who can talk like this? It's like Jesus has a new way of speaking. Check out what he says here in, in detail. He has a new way of speaking, and in every statement here, it, it beckons us to him. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, I love that. Jesus isn't, isn't like, oh, well, what she did wasn't that bad. Oh, it's no big deal. Like, like God is cool, God is kind, and, and he kind of grades on a curve, so as long as you try hard and are a good person, I'm sure it'll work out. No, no, no. He's like, her sins are many. You're like, she's jacked up, like for real. Like her heart is far from God. He has no problem saying that while at the same time bringing in a radical mercy that says, I know you and I want you just as you are. That's the gospel. You are far worse than you think. Trust me. My heart is so wickedly deceitful. Even right now, I've got a new heart and it still wanders. And yet God says, even though his sins are many, I want him. He's mine. 
Why? Because it's about Jesus, not about me and not about you. For she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. And so what that means is that basically she didn't love her way into forgiveness. It's that she loved after she was forgiven. Her love is a response to forgiveness, not in earning. Next slide, please. Jesus' new way of speaking, your sins are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. This is where we can see it wasn't about the woman's love that earned her salvation. It was what Jesus would accomplish through his death and resurrection. It was the grace of God toward this woman that she received by faith that made her right. And then her response was this overwhelming worship. Jesus, as he speaks toward this woman, speaks in a new way. He doesn't just randomly attach Bible scriptures to this situation. He doesn't um, pray for this woman. He doesn't um, just say holy things that would make this woman feel encouraged. He makes the situation about himself for both the woman and Simon. And the invitation is, listen, younger brother, older brother, person who's run far from God because of what they've done immorally, and person who's run far from God because of all their self-saving acts, you can both come because it's about me. That's the invitation of Jesus. It's a new way of speaking. He is highly invitational. And we begin to see that hospitality is invitational. That the whole idea of hospitality, it has an invitational nature to it. Don't you know that like, when you think about being hospitable, you think about, well, that means I'm probably going to invite someone over or invite someone to an event. That's not a bad thing. It's just a start to something better. I love inviting people. I don't, no, that's not true because it makes me feel weird sometimes to invite people, because I'm not sure how they're going to respond to it. And, and I don't, but, but when I invite people, I'm beginning to learn that that's simply the beginning. If I invite them to church, or I invite them to Easter, or I invite them over to my house, it's simply the beginning exercise of what I want to do more and more, is, is not just stop by inviting them to the event, but I want to take that same exercise and begin to invite them to the person of Jesus. We have a saying in this church that make it about Jesus. It's at the end of every sermon. It's a slide. Sometimes I, I use it as a slide and sometimes it's just for my own heart because I need to re be reminded to make it about Jesus all the time. Hospitality is invitational. See that next slide, please, Allie. A culture of hospitality invites. A culture of hospitality invites. And, and this is a bit maybe of a shift for us because here, here's, ready? here's the shift. We're pretty good at information. We're not always as good at invitation. I can even preach like this. I can tell you about Jesus, but I can oftentimes in a sermon never invite you to the person of Jesus. Does that make sense? We can even share our story or share the gospel and, and it be informative and yet not invitational. And so there's a couple of shifts here as we think about the, this way of hospitality that, that all encourage us as we prepare ourselves to, to take communion. And, and here's, here's the idea. That first of all, we're shifting from information to invitation. Where we're inviting people um, to, to consider the person of Jesus, to actually consider making a move from where they are to the person of Jesus. When, when we're counseling, when we're talking, when we're in these relationships, when we're, lo when we're loving and we're knowing, and, that, and then we get the opportunity to speak, I want to encourage us to speak like Jesus spoke, to make it about him, to, as you're in conversation with people, as you're in relationship with people, to ask God to show you, how can you lovingly and relevantly invite this person from where they are to the person of Jesus? Not to getting better, not to another program, although that might be part of the course, but how ultimately can I invite them to the person of Jesus where they begin to see that in the midst of their divorce and their desire to reconcile with their spouse or in the midst of their child who's in their addiction and they don't know whether to let them stay at home or not or in the midst of job loss, whatever the case may be, God has placed us there to listen, to love, to care for them, but to gently help them to realize it's not another job they need, it's the person of Jesus they need. And we get the opportunity, as Jesus hosts parties that we're involved with, to invite them from where they are to resting 
of finding their acceptance and their security and their treasure in the person of Jesus. That's what the cultural shift might begin to look like. And I'm going to ask the team to come out. As we prepare for um, communion, I want you to understand that this is actually preparation for us to make those invites. You know how it's really easy to talk about things you love? And it's really forced to talk about things you should? So a lot of us feel like we should share the gospel, and we feel this burden of sharing the gospel. And it's like, well, I didn't share the gospel. I missed it, or I blew it. Or, and, 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 and we kind of walk around like, oh, man, I missed my opportunity, or I messed it up. And, but listen, most of you, like if you have kids or a favorite sports team, or you're, you know, it's NBA playoffs, you have no problem talking about things you love. You just enter into it like, hey, man, I don't, I, I don't really care if you love this or not. I love it so much, I got to tell you about it. You've got to hear about it. You've got to taste what I've tasted. The only way that we're going to be able to have a culture of hospitality that becomes more invitational is if we become more like the woman of the street. In our preparation, our preparation, if you can go to the next slide, Allie, is not just worship. It's mindful worship. It's mindful worship. It's worship that's not necessarily mindful about the surrounding lights and this and that and whether I like the song or not. It's mindful about who we are and who he is. That's the only way you end up falling at the feet of Jesus because we're never going to crush it up here enough to bring you into that context. I find myself in worship analyzing, grading, thinking about performance, thinking about how we can make it better. And for a good season, I have not been a mindful worshiper. I've tried to worship, but my mind's been elsewhere. And God in his grace has invited me and reminded me to engage in mindful worship that remembers exactly who I am as a man of the street who gets to come, touch, and partake in the real body of Christ. And so communion is a symbol. It's a sign of that body of Christ. It's not the real body. We believe that the real body of Christ is at the right hand of the Father and coming again. But as we partake in this meal, we're reminded that we get to come in off the streets and throw ourselves at the feet of Jesus and partake. And communion is open and available to any and everyone who's willing to come in that way, understanding themselves as a sinner and Christ as a Savior. If we have sin in our lives, Scripture says that we should examine ourselves. And if we're making peace with hardness of heart in some way, Scripture says, um, actually, don't take this time, but, but ask God to soften your heart and bring you repentance in that area. Maybe he'll do it even in this moment. I'm going to give us a moment to just consider our ways, to be mindful about who we are so that we might be more mindful about who he is. And then come. Needy. Hungry looking to partake of the body that was broken and the blood that was shed for me. Let's pray. Father, we ask that in this moment, you would prepare our hearts. God, we want to make invitations that are truly hospitable. We want to be like that woman who would go out and talk about you, Jesus, after that dinner. We want to have that same fervor, that same passion for you, but we, we can't get it. It's like, it like evades us. It evades me. And Jesus, I think it's just because I forgot who I am. I forgot who you are. And I forgot that you actually do something when I worship you like that. So Jesus, we ask that you would help us examine our ways. We want to take this in a manner worthy of you. Forgive us where we've been selfish, apathetic, forgetful. 
Forgive us where our hearts have been divided. We confess our sin before you. We repent and turn to you as our great treasure. And we come hungry for more. You come to him in that way and he receives all gladly. Amen. Amen. Father, we're thankful to have been in your presence in such a special way. We believe that in the midst of this type of worship, that you usher in the atmosphere of heaven, that you bring deliverance, that you bring healing, and that you bring life. And so we're believing those things have happened this morning. We're believing even now that there are people who, who um, will be moved to tears because they, for the first time, realize there's a place at the table for them. If that's you, you can just tell the Lord, Lord, I know who I am. I'm very mindful of my past. I'm mindful of my, even my present and my future. But for the first time now, I'm mindful of who you are, Jesus, that you died for me, that you overcame my death through your resurrection, that you overcame my sin, and that I can have forgiveness and freedom through faith in you. I come to you as the woman. I come to you off the streets and give myself to you. And I worship you this morning. God, may that be the pattern of our heart over and over and over again until you come again. Lord Jesus, we love you and we worship you. Amen and amen. Love you guys. See you next week.